Oh, long one. Yeah, I know, right? Hey, everybody, we are online again. Yes, live with uh, with Andrew Hallam. Um, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't look like you guys got very much of the um, the information that. Uh, that Andrew Andrew was sharing, so um, so we're gonna we're just gonna kind of do it again and maybe do a little bit of an abbreviated uh, uh, introduction. So uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna bring uh, Andrew into the picture here. Hey, uh, there he is again, right? So uh, unfortunately, you were you were on a blank screen, um, so I don't I actually don't know if people were able to listen. So uh, so that's always <laughs> always one of the challenges. So so you were you were saying that you know you're you're um, you know you, you you didn't grow up in a in a in a wealthy family and um, you know and had to kind of figure out a lot of stuff yourself, right? You know and uh, and then and then that combined with kind of that that teacher in you. Right, you know, kind of you developed this passion for for educating, you know, people with regards to you know their finances and all of that kind of stuff. Because you found, you you tried it out on yourself and you discovered that you know a lot of that uh, that worked. That's kind of the summary, right? You know, so so tell tell me, uh, you know, because we met. Oh my God, we we've, we've known each other. I I'm gonna say it must be 20 years, right? So so I think. Uh, because when, when did you when did you um, come to Singapore? What was your year? Uh, two thousand three, so seventeen years. Yeah, seventeen years. Seventeen That's a long time years. Ago. That's a long time ago. Yeah, and uh, and and I remember you know a few a few years later, um, you had a you had a, a bout with uh, with cancer and some some setbacks. And even though you were you know an extremely fit and healthy guy, I I, I remember. I think people still talk about your uh, sub. You know what is it? Sub four minute uh, mile or something like that. Like it's uh, it, it gets faster every year. People talk about it. Every year it gets faster. <laughs> yeah. So so, but you're you know you're definitely definitely that athlete at heart, right? You know, and um, and so tell us a little bit about about you know kind of you know how that all happened and and you know how that came about. Now that you know. Moving to Singapore saved my life in a way because without without recognizing it, um, I moved to Singapore in 2003, and and I moved to the country. For those who've not moved to uh, to the to the Lion City, you have to t take certain medical tests, and one of them was a chest X-ray, and they found something. They're looking really for something like tuberculosis. You know, they're screening for that. And they saw something on the chest x-ray in 2003, and they said, oh, that's suspicious. Let's get you checked out. So I had an MRI, and they found what they believed to be a, a benign growth in one of my ribs. And they said, you know, it has a defined border to it, so in all likelihood, it's, uh, it's benign. But what we'll do is we'll check you annually just to make sure you might have been born with this thing, but we really don't know, and sometimes these things can turn malignant. So... I regularly then went in and had an MRI check, and then one year, I skipped it. And, you know, you start to get a little complacent and think, oh, it's probably probably something I've had a long time. It really doesn't make a big difference here whether I skip a year. Um, I skipped a year, and my, my wife said, hey, look, you, you got to go in and get this thing checked. So... I ended up going in after the skipped year and found that during that year, the thing turned malignant. So it was a chondrosarcoma is what they call it. It's a cancer of the bone. It's primary cancer. It's kind of rare. It's more like something people get as a secondary cancer. It's one of those things that ends up eventually um, often killing older people. So it w went in from one rib. It uh, started in one rib, went into the rib above, the rib below, was encroaching into my spine. Once it gets into the spinal area, you're, you're completely done. And it was really, really close. 
what was interesting to me is that it was completely asymptomatic. So I felt absolutely fine um, when they discovered it. I had no symptoms at all. In fact, I guess it was uh, just a couple of months before I I won one of Singapore's biggest running races. Um, I was one of the I was the oldest winner in the race's history. I won the the J.P. Morgan Chase Corporate Challenge. And you know, twenty thousand people in the event, and and I crossed the line first. Um, I guess I was thirty-eight years old, and I was thinking, this is fantastic. And then found out just a couple of months later that I had this asymptomatic cancer, and was really, really close to death. So once it gets into the spinal canal, you're completely, you're done. So had the surgery, and after the surgery, they don't know whether you're going to walk again. That's one thing when you start cutting into the, the spinal area. Um, they were going to put a, a mesh titanium Gore-Tex piece in my back to attach the um, three ribs that were now incomplete. So they'd cut out three ribs and they took out quite a bit of the spine or uh, the, the bone that's around the spine, the spinal mm-hmm. process. And they were going to take a piece that was uh, a mesh titanium Gore-Tex piece about the size of, size of my hand. And, and attach it to the floating ribs and then, and then web it out, and connect it to the pieces of the, the bone surrounding the spine. Um, and, and here's an, kind of an interesting side point. They, when they cut into my back, I mean, I'm not a big guy by any stretch. Obviously, mm-hmm. I was a distance runner. <laughs> but I, I liked to keep fit all around and did a lot of other things like push-ups and and dips and core exercises and loads of pull-ups. And so when they actually cut into my back, they told me later that it was fairly dense, um, dense muscle. And as a result of that, they said they gambled on not putting in this foreign object. Anytime you can get away with not putting a a big foreign object into a human being is a good idea Mm because, of course, it can attract bacteria and your body can reject it. And they, they took my left lower latissimus dorsi muscle, so one of the big back muscles, and they folded it over the hole and then sutured it. Oh, and wow. then just kind of, I hope that that's going to hold. Um, and then afterward, you know, as soon as I woke up, they asked me if I could move my toes. And that's when I realized how serious this was because of how happy they seemed to be when I said I could. Uh-huh. Um, and I've heard, I've learned since then that that's actually quite typically, typically Asian. In uh-huh. that, uh, I met a woman who had a very similar surgery in Canada, and they talked to her beforehand about. All right, now she said to me, "Wasn't it scary when they talked to you about all the risks and the fact that you you could end up a paraplegic and and all that?" And I I said, "Well, no. I mean, they didn't tell me any of that stuff." And she just laughed. She says she used to live in Japan, and she says. Yeah, that's kind of what happens in that part of the world. It's a little bit different. So anyway, these doctors were quite thrilled that I could move my toes because they were in there with a giant saw. Um, uh-huh. Didn't really know. Obviously, they knew what they were doing, but of course, there's always mysteries when you're getting into cutting nerves and such. Um, and then I had a spinal support vest that uh, you know went out with the wheelchair, spinal support vest, sort of getting back into the, essentially learning to walk. Um, going to physiotherapy, and then eventually had a, a thrill to say I had a, a great recovery. Uh-huh. Wow. I mean, it's, that's, that's such an incredible story. I mean, um, you know, the, the fact that you, you kind of, you know, went through all that. And I, re- I remember, you know, the, what, what I was real, you know, most impressed with was your positive attitude, right? I mean, you were, you were always so positive. And, uh, and the other thing, too, is, you know, how how willing you were to you just you know I, I, again kind of you know share with people and and educate and um, you know and just uh, and, and just that openness I think you know uh, was real um, warm felt and inspiring I think for a lot of people too because so many people saw your journey and uh, you know the um, the challenges that you had with that it was pretty phenomenal right you know so so and then and and, and at what stage you know did you get to you know kind of thinking about okay it's time for me to you know, write a book? It was, um, I guess it was a couple of years later, and I'd been writing magazine articles, personal finance stories, and I had already been um, giving sort of free financial seminars at the school and giving out free books. So I'd spent 
like thousands of dollars buying what I thought were really simple books for people to understand and gifting them to the teachers, knowing that the teachers wouldn't be getting defined benefit pensions because they worked at a private school overseas. And, uh, and I was a bit frustrated because I had these book clubs that I'd say to people, I'd send an email out, and I'd say, okay, if you were one of the 40 people that received the latest book, why don't we get together and we'll, we'll talk about it? And uh-huh. people would come and they would, um, they would say they understood the books. And then I would start to ask them questions. Mm-hmm. And it was at that point that they said, well, okay, there are a lot of things in there that we really didn't understand. And that's when I spoke to my editor at Money Sense Magazine in Toronto. And I, I spoke to him on the phone and I still remember it. I said, look, I'm, man, his name is Ian McGugan. I said, Ian, I'm pretty frustrated by this. I, I spent so much money and I thought I was helping people by buying them these books and they didn't understand them. And he said, well, that's, you know, you know what you need to do now. Um, mm-hmm. You need to write your own book. Mm-hmm. And use those people as use those people as a guide to help you. So show them pieces of it as you construct it, mm-hmm. and then ask them really honestly what do you understand and what do you not understand. And then um, that was the the genesis for for the book that I ended up writing. Um, so yeah, that that worked out well. Wow. Yeah. You know, it it is quite quite interesting because you know I, I think I think that was the. Um, you know, same thing for me when I when I wrote my book, right? You know, was was it was really uh, kind of the same thing as where, you know, whenever whenever people are asking you questions or you know if you're if you're running a workshop or whatever, there there are just so many things you want to be able to say and do and give details mm-hmm. and uh, and <laughs> it just becomes so much easier when you know when people have these questions and say, here, take a copy of my book and uh, you're <laughs> you'll be you'll be fine, right? You know, so uh, so that's that's. <laughs> That's that's awesome. So, um, so so something I wanted to you know also kind of talk about is is a part of your life that um, I, I know you write a, a lot about it in in your blog, right? You know, which is which is kind of that um, minimalistic uh, approach, right? You know, to uh, just being being money savvy and you know kind of kind of applying yourself. And you've you've traveled all around the world, right? You know, I mean, it's 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 crazy you know when we just see the posts and stuff like that of of your travels it's it's incredible um tell tell us a little bit about how that how that all started with the traveling and just, the yeah uh-huh well it's it started uh, in in 2014 when i was teaching in singapore i mean prior to that i was invited by a few schools to give financial talks and i did mm-hmm. but it was 2014 that it really went kind of crazy in a cool way because we decided we would take one year off (laughs) Um, we decided let's quit our teaching jobs let's take one year off and let's just travel and as 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 you would know if you're an international school teacher and you're thinking about taking a year off halfway through that year or even less than halfway through that year you have to start applying for new positions And so we thought, well, that's not going to be fun because, you know, we're going to be really only enjoying six months off and then we're going to be looking for a job Uh and then all the stresses associated with relocating. So we uh, we decided we would take two years off, which led to three, which led to four, which has led to six. Mm -hmm. And so we've done all kinds of, of fun things. The first thing we did was we decided we would ride our tandem bicycle across Spain. We thought that might be kind of cool and do the um, Camino Santiago route. Uh-huh. And uh, and then we decided that we would go down to uh, Mexico and spend some time there and exploring. But what ended up happening, Marcel, was people started to email me and ask, can you come and give a certain talk? Can you come and give us a talk on finance? Uh-huh. Um, they knew that I had been doing it previous, and the invitations started to come, um, and they were really prolific in number. So okay. to, give you an, to give you an idea... What was what was kind of funny is in 2017, I said I said basically yes to everything, and and for me, I didn't want to be a guy that was uh, profiting from it. I didn't want to be selling books at talks, and sometimes I wouldn't even mention my book. I certainly didn't bring my book um, to the talks that I was giving. I really felt like it was important to 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 give what I knew it was kind of like uh to serve and to help the community Mm -hmm. and in 2017 over a six month period I gave 90 talks in 13 different countries 
Wow. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, and it shows you that the, the vast amount of interest, right. You know, in, in this, in this topic as well, you know I mean? So it's, it's, it's quite, I mean, it's, it's, it's so funny how, you know, um, we, we, we go to school and, and, you know, and we, we, we're supposed to be educated in all things important in life. And then the one thing that they, you know, somehow, you know, don't teach us is how to manage our finances. Right. You know, and, yeah. um, and how many people still like, even in my age group are still kind of going, well, what, what, what do I do? <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty, yeah. pretty in, insane to think, you know, it's a, it's like my daughter said after graduating, you know, um, high school, she said, well, that was, you know, that was 12 years of, of basically not learning anything functional. And I still got, I still need to go figure out how to do my finances <laughs> and pay taxes. Right. You know, and, uh, and, and I think that's, that's, that's a, you know, very, a very important point, right. You know, is, is how, how do you, how do you do that? And it's, a, it's such a shame that we, you know, that that isn't a, a, a much, you know, kind of broader conversation, right. You know, and it's almost, mm -hmm. I, and, and, and it's almost like, um, it's almost up there with mental health conversations, right? You know, it, it seems to be like this sensitive conversation where you can't be in a group of people, right? And, and talking about, you know, struggling with managing your finances, you know, because there's kind of this, this shame, right? Around, around, um, you know, kind of like, you know, cause then you look like you're out of control or you're not successful or you're, you know, kind of anything like that. And the, very, very much mm. the same way as when you're at a party and you're telling people, "Hey, you know, I, I, I you know, I'm not happy. I don't, I don't feel good. I don't, you know, and all." Of, and and people just kind of respond very strangely to that because we're supposed to be these happy-go-lucky, you know, presenting ourselves as as successful people all the time, and we, you know, we're 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 not allowed to show ourselves as being vulnerable, right? You know, because we're we're afraid that you know the world is going to do something with that information and. Um, you know, it's, it's, it might set us back in some way or another. And, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, maybe they're right. Right. You know, so, uh, so, so I find, I find on a lot of, a lot of the, um, a lot of the coaching, right. That, um, that I do, oh, I got a, got a comment from Thameson, uh, and she says, uh, you know, she, she, she totally agrees with that whole finance conversation. Right. You know, so, uh, so, so absolutely, absolutely. Um, so thanks for, for commenting Tamsin. That's, uh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so the, uh, so, so, so what I do a lot with my, with my coaching clients too, is, is rather than kind of worrying, right? Because I, I, it, I, I don't know if you see that, but a lot of people worry about not having enough. Right. And I, and I think that's, that's part of our, part of our biological makeup, right? You know, if you, if you, if you look at the brain, right, you know, our, our brains are, are designed to, you know, kind of basically do three things, right? You know, and, 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 and unfortunately, pretty much every single one of our choices in life is based on these kind of three primary motives, right? Which is, which is one is, uh, uh, you know, to, to avoid pain, right? Or discomfort. Uh, the, the second is to, um, you know, consume energy, right? You know, so the, the more energy we consume, the, uh, you know, the, the safer we're going to feel. And then, the, and then the third one is, you know, when we're, when we're consuming energy and we're, um, and we're avoiding, you know, pain and discomfort, uh, we seek pleasure, right? You know, and, uh, and so those are, those tend to be our kind of three primary motives. And so, so we, we have this tendency to, um, perceive, the world, you know, the, the things that aren't within our grasp, we tend to perceive them as potential sources of pain, potential sources of threat. And, you know, and, and what do, what do we need to do? And then of course, with a lot of social cues, right. And in a first world country, uh, you know, with, with media and TVs and movies, you know, it's, it's, you know, women, women are kind of portrayed, right. Is that, you know, a successful woman still today, right. You know, a successful woman is, you know, at the side of a powerful man and, you know, and, uh, and that, and that, uh, and that she's gorgeous all the time and, uh, you know, and slender and all of these kind of things. And, and if, you know, and for the guy, you know, for some reason he has to be this billionaire, right. You know, who, by the way, looks completely chiseled, 
right? You know, like <laughs> superhero chiseled. So, so he's he's not allowed to work because you know if he if he works, he can't be working on his body, right? You know, and so <laughs> and so and so there's this there's this kind of this unrealistic expectation I think that boys and girls still grow up with in society, right? You know, where where they 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 they're just grown up with this fear of being you know just kind of not having enough, you know, and uh, and and that is that is to a point where, you know, I, I've had, I've had clients who, you know, have panic attacks, you know, because they're afraid they're not going to be able to send their kid to Harvard. Right. You know, and, and they're not going to, they're not going to have that mention, you know, and, 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 and it's, yeah. it's really, it's really interesting how, you know, it, it almost looks like, you know, there is, there is no life, right. If I, if I don't have these certain objects, these certain things that, that, become symbols of my success, right? You know, you know, and it's, and for some people it's a status symbol, but for other people it's just a comfort symbol, right? It's a success symbol. It's proof to themselves that they're successful. But the, but I find that, you know, the bar is set so high, right? That, that we're, that we're, what we end up chasing that dream, you know, that, that, which is not really often not even our dream. It's a dream that's imposed upon us. And we, we end up chasing that to a point where that becomes the only object of possession that we want to we and we we frantically and obsessively chase after that to a point where we forget about you know all all of the you know magical things that are happening around us in life and the experiences you know that we that we can gain you know the the comments still today is like you know I'm um, I'm going to work my ass off and I'm going to I'm going to retire at 50 Right. You know, and then I'm going to start doing this or whatever and say, you know, how, how, you know, who says you're alive at 50? Right. You yes. know, and it's, <laughs> yes. it's, it's a, you know, and, and, and I think that's that's one thing that I really love about about your work. Right. Is that you you balance both of those things out, you know, for you, for you, you know, your your definition of wealth, I think, is is something very different. Right. What what is what is for you kind of that that definition of wealth? Well, I mean, it's it. I think holistically, the wealth is wealth is wealth is happiness, and wealth is health. And and if you ask people why they're pursuing money or things, material things, they'll say, "Well, I want to be happy." You mm. know, if you continue to ask that question, why? So, why do you want that particular job? Mm -hmm. Okay, well that. Often it's okay. Beyond it gives me purpose and I enjoy it. But often it's well, it's a it's a good position. Why do you want a good position? So mm -hmm. I can make more money. Why do you want to make more money? So I can have a certain lifestyle. Why do you want that certain lifestyle? If you continue to ask that question, why, why, why? It will come down to somebody eventually getting to that base level where they say, because I want to be happy. Mm -hmm. And then the interesting thing about that. Marcel, is when you start to look at studies on happiness and try to determine whether there's any kind of connection uh, between happiness and wealth, uh -huh. it's, uh, it's a very tenuous connection indeed. In fact, studies have shown that happiness increases with wealth up to a certain point, and that point is far, far lower than any of us would ever expect. It's, uh, it's kind of like, you know, it's natural for people to think that if they eat a piece of pizza, they're going to really enjoy that and enjoy two or three slices even more. So their happiness level augments based on how much pizza they can consume. Um, I, as a kid, I would have been thrilled with an entire pizza. I would have sat down and eaten the whole thing. But even that, I would have known full well that if somebody said, well, here's a second pizza. You can eat that too. And I would have gorge on both. Even as a kid, I would have known that well, no, actually, that wouldn't have made me happier because that one piece, it would have been more than enough. But what we don't often relate to is the understanding that with money, it's exactly the same as that extra pizza. It's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So looking at behavioral economics and looking at happiness studies, it suggests that happiness increases up to a certain level of income. And beyond that point, there's no added level of contentment that's mm -hmm. derived from having more money. And the mm -hmm. irony, Marcel, there is that Often those people that are pursuing more and more beyond where that threshold of no longer improving, sort of they reach that level where there's no longer an improvement, 
at the same time, they're often sacrificing the things that truly do augment their levels of happiness. So mm -hmm. time spent with people they love, time spent looking after that, that, that vessel that you're born with, which is your mind and your body, mm -hmm. and that, that connection there. So they sacrifice the things that matter for something that adds no longer adds any further level of contentment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's a weird primal thing, um, but it is kind of cool to see behavioral studies um, calling this out and showing us, mm -hmm. uh, showing this that this is a, is a, is a fruitless pursuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, it, and it, it reminds me a little bit as, as you're talking, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, of Mas Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, that 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 if, if we were to put happiness, for example, at the top of the pyramid as in, in that kind of level of self actualization. Right. You know, we we, we might look at finances and money as, um, you know, if that becomes our air. Right. Our physiological need, which is at the base of that, um, uh, uh, you know, pyramid. Right. You know, and the next one, of course, is sense of safety. And then there is, you know, social connection. And then there is, you know, um, uh, you know, your, your self-esteem, right? You know, and then from there you lead into, mm -hmm. into self-actualization. And I find that uh, most people have a tendency to get stuck, right? They, they, they get stuck in that, um, it, whether, whether it's their physiological need or their um, safety or their, uh, you know, it, social connections, you know, connections with people, their experiences with people, and of course also their self-esteem because they... You know, their self-esteem is driven on outcomes that they anticipate in their lives, right? You know, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. I, you know, if I have, you know, a million dollars, for example, or five, you know, five million, whatever it is, then I'm going to kind of feel like I, I'm worthy, right? I'm successful, right? You know, and, and yeah. until, <laughs> until then, I'm, you know, I'm useless, right? You know, <laughs> and, and I, and, and, and it's, it's quite interesting how, um, you know, people really kind of struggle. And of course with you, you know, you and I of course talk, talk a lot about, you know, kind of with that Maslow's hierarchy that, you know, finance is, is not the most important thing that's lit. Finance is not even in the Maslow's hierarchy, right? You know, we, we confuse right. Right. finance for a lot of these things. It's, you know, your, your, your Maslow's hierarchy is physiological need. Can you breathe? Right. You know, do you have healthy <laughs> right. enough right. lungs, <laughs> right. You know, to breathe. And if you can take a breath of air, you're going to last a while longer. Yeah. So you're fine. Right. You know, and then, and then that second one is a sense of safety. Do I have a roof over my head? If, if there's right. a roof over your head and there's a roof over your kids and family's head and you can afford enough money to, to buy their food and to do, you know, things like that, you know, your, your safety is taken care of. And then it's about, you know, your, your social esteem, you know, who are you connecting with? How, you know, how are you connecting with people? Are you, are you, you know, are you more of a giver? than a taker are you you know are, are you are you living a life of selflessness or self fullness right you know and um and i think those are th those become the important conversations really and a lot of that kind of has a dollar sign right you know is my you know is when i think a roof above my head you know i'm you know and you're happy with a shack Right. You know, if there's if there's even a home built shack on the beach somewhere. Right. You know, that can keep your family warm and dry. You know, you're 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 you're, you're taking care of. Right. You know, and so anything else on top of that is what I like to call icing on the cake. Right. You know, it's it's, it's right. good. It's good to have cake. It's good to have, you know, a certain amount. Right. You know, but once that's once that's taken care of, you're just you're just making the icing thicker, right? How and how thick do you want that icing really to be on your cake? It's kind of like a conversation of yeah. that second pizza, right? And I think that's what people do. They keep they keep chasing after trying to make thicker icing, thinking that the cake's going to taste better, right? You know, and then one day they come to this realization, you know, at, at a certain age where, dude, all I've been eating is icing, you know, <laughs> and and it's uh, it's not good for me. Right. You know, because uh, that's yeah. uh, that creates a lot of inflammation in our bodies and it creates, you know, it's high sugar and it's, you know, chemicals and it's, you know, all of these kind of things only come to come to a realization that, uh, you know, now now we're, you know, half half the person that we are compared to what we were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. 
right? You know, and, and I see a lot of that, right? That, that per, especially in my age group and, and of course your age group too, kind of, kind of coming to that realization that uh oh moments, right? You know, it's like, holy crap, you know, here I've just kind of been chasing after this invisible dream um, only to sacrifice everything that's really important to me. But that, that realization right. comes so late in life, you know? So, uh, so how, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you have conversations with, with, with people. What, what kind of advice would you give somebody, right? You know, if they're, um, if, if, if they're kind of, you know, having the same kind of, they're in the same space, what, what would that conversation look like for you, between you and a client, for example? Well, I guess you have, you know, when you're looking at those basic needs, it's knowing that uh -huh. you can have enough money to have those basic needs today uh -huh. and to also have enough money for those basic needs tomorrow, mm -hmm. which allows you allows you to certain choices, knowing mm -hmm. that at some point you may not want to work or mm -hmm. be able to work, mm -hmm. but you want to be in a position where you don't have to work to to reach those basic needs, those satisfying mm -hmm. needs of the, the health, the, the shelter, um, bit of spare money so that you can enjoy some good experiences with people that you love and you mm -hmm. respect. So the idea too, I think is one of the challenges is, is turning this component of this component of conventional wisdom, suggesting that I guess we won't call it wisdom. Let's call it a culture. It's a, there's an encroachment of an unhealthy culture that makes us believe that when we acquire material things, we can gain levels of happiness. Mm -hmm. And the more material things we acquire, unfortunately, when we're spending a lot of money on those things, that's money that we're not necessarily able to invest for our future. Mm -hmm. And some people will call this delaying gratification or delaying pleasure. Mm -hmm. But studies suggest that it isn't that at all. Mm -hmm. So to give you an example, um, if somebody brought, buys a brand new iPhone, they might be really excited to have the latest iPhone 36 or whatever it might happen to be in that given year. They're, they're pining for it, they get it, they're excited, they've dropped a whole bunch of money on it. Sometimes they've even gone into debt to acquire it, so they put it on a credit card. Two things occur. We know that one, debt does equal misery. So we have all kinds of studies suggesting that when you get behind the eight ball financially and there's a debt uh, that you can't maintain mm -hmm. or a debt that just is so large such that it takes away from certain other choices in your life. This drags us down. And the phone itself, as a pleasure mechanism, mm -hmm. it's like a sugar fix. It's like you ingesting a whole bunch of sugar, and immediately you're excited about it. Uh -huh. but, about a, but it doesn't take long before that's just another phone. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Studies that's have been right. done on cars. There was uh -huh. a Michigan State University study done uh -huh. on vehicles. Yeah. And they looked at people who had... Uh, high status vehicles versus people that you know drove ten year old Hondas or Toyotas. Oh, yeah. They wanted to differentiate and to see whether the high status vehicle actually augmented their driving experience and made them enjoy driving more. Mm -hmm. And so the question is asked on two different levels. So a guy named Daniel Kahneman who won a Nobel Prize in behavioral economics who wrote this great book called Thinking Fast and Slow, mm -hmm. he said that when we ask somebody a question and we'll ask them something like, well, you have that brand new Mercedes Benz. Are you happier with that than you would be with a 10-year-old Toyota? They'll mm -hmm. say yes. So what that mm -hmm. is, is that's called reflective happiness, what yes. comes out of your mouth. But mm -hmm. that's not actually real. Uh -huh. the real. The real measurement of happiness is what Daniel Kahneman calls experiential happiness. Mm -hmm. That's the actual happiness that you feel. Mm -hmm. And what this Michigan State University study did was it asked people with varying levels of vehicles a whole slew of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, like a really good study would do, it didn't let the people know exactly what it was looking for. Mm -hmm. So it asked all kinds of different questions. But the thing that they were seeking is they wanted to know whether they actually enjoyed their daily driving experience more if they had a high status vehicle versus a lower cost, cheaper vehicle. And they mm -hmm. found that there was no correlation whatsoever. So the interesting thing, again, is it's like that latest phone. You get that brand new car. You're excited about it for a little while. But before long, it just becomes that tool that gets you from A to B. Uh, and we get used to it. So that's called yeah. hedonic adaptation. So uh -huh. when we go into debt, especially if we go into debt to purchase an item whereby we just hedonically adapt to it, mm -hmm. uh, then it, it then it ends up being a cause of misery on one side 
And potentially, it can be that thing that jeopardizes our future safety, shelter, food in the belly at mm-hmm. some point in the future when we decide or cannot, somebody decides for us that we can't actually work. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's such a great uh, explanation. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And, and from a, <coughs> I'm sorry, from a, from a neuroscience perspective, you know, we, we, we understand the, you know, that primal brain, uh, you know, uh, the limbic brain, how, you know, how, how it doesn't understand long-term consequences. Right. And, and, that it, <laughs> and, and, and that it has, uh, that it has a passion for, you know, kind of short-term pleasure and, and novelty. Right. You know, and, and it will do so at the cost of our own health. Right. Because health is a long term consequence. And so we would we will we will, um, you know, sacrifice long term health for short term pleasure. Right. You know, and, and, I, and, and that that's exactly that same that same process where we then um, desensitize our brains actually rewire themselves to to desensitize, to stop to stop being excited by the things that we have. It's just like a drug, right? You know, it's like when somebody takes drugs, you know, the first time they take the drug, they get an enormous hit, but right away the brain's going to adapt by, by you know, making the brain more resistant to that drug. And so it takes right. more and more of that drug to, to, you know, for us to, to feel that same kind of high, right? You know, and, and, uh, and, and in all likelihood, there's that, there's that same mechanism that that happens here as well, where where we become slaves of our emotional brains, right? Our limbic brains. We we end up making emotional decisions rather than rational ones, right? You know, because because our our you know rational brain, which is a prefrontal cortex, you know, does require the energy to uh, to be able to make these kind of decisions, right? You know. And, and what I find what I find really interesting too is is you know of course a lot of the work that I do is is working with corporates and and understanding you know decision making processes and for example and looking at the brain's capacity to be able to to be able to do that and uh, and, and what I find is you know if, if um, and and there might be I don't know if there are studies out but for example people who are in, who live in high stress jobs right they 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 have decreased cognitive capacity to be able to make these kind of um, rational decisions over emotional decisions because the the um, energy level in, in in the emotional brain and that limbic brain is much greater than the energy levels in the prefrontal cortex and the reason for this is, is because if the if if capacity levels you know drop energy levels drop in the brain like you know if there are not enough nutrients and things like that what happens is it kind of kind of decreases inward so so because the um, limbic area is so so close to the base of the brain um, energy levels are going to be reserved more and more for primal behaviors and life sustaining behaviors so our our decisions become survival specific right you know rather rather than kind of thinking you know kind of long term what's in the best interest and willpower related type type decisions right so so it, it'll be interesting to see too is like you know people who for example live in very high stress environments right you know who are who are in toxic relationships maybe who have you know jobs they hate and all of that kind of stuff whether that also increases the tendency to spend more Right, you know, to, to go into debt mm. because because their brains are seeking some form of kind of short term pleasure, right? You know, it's like you know, it's like if my wife is yelling at me, or if my husband is yelling at me, or my kids are yelling at me, I can go sit in the car, right? You know, and so and actually, I, I actually remember seeing a commercial uh, that depicted exactly as I'm talking was exactly that scene was was about six months ago, um, and it was you know one of those luxury vehicles, the same thing, uh, you know the. Uh, what happened is, is you know, this wife walks into in, into the house, and the in-laws have arrived with you know who else, and it's kind of like you know one of those one of those chaotic situations. She says, "I'll be right back," and you know, and she she goes into her car, and she just kind of sits and goes, ah. right, you know, kind of kind of showing that that you know that making that decision of having that luxury car, you know satisfies that short-term impulse to be able to regulate yourself right you know so um so i so yeah you're you're absolutely right i think there's there, there's there's a lot to that the 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 other question i'm sure that a lot of the viewers you know will, will probably have is is so you know what do i what do i do about that right you know how do i how do i stop myself from um from from you know making those irrational decisions and 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 what can i do to uh you know kind of make sure that I can, I can see, you know, things a lot, um, I, I guess I can see the real value 
right, of, of, of the objects that I have in my life. And, and the reason why I find that so interesting is because, um, you know, Ursula and I, you know, Kilani, you know, she moved out, right, and she lives in, she lives in Toronto now. And, and so Ursula and I, we, we first, when Kilani was growing up, we had this massive house, right? And uh, where she could run around all over the place and, you know, and, and it was great. And, and over, the, over the years, we decided to downsize. And, and when I remember we moved from a six bedroom house to a, uh, to, to, to a, to a three bedroom condo, right? And, um, and it, was, it was like one third the size. And, uh, and, and prior to making that decision, we were both like, man, ah, you know, it's like, how does that kind of feel like? And, and it was funny is because the moment we moved into that condo and downsized, it was, it was like, we forgot that we had lived in this big house. Like the, once the decision was made, right, that decision justification, <clears throat> it was very easy to discard that idea of living in that big house or that idea of having an expensive car or all of those kind of things. It's, 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 it's the moment you actually make that step, you come to this realization that so much of, of the things that we possess <clears throat> are, are adding absolutely no value right, to, to the lives that we live. And, and, and we, we went through this because, you know, having a six bedroom house means that we had a ton of stuff. And we, had, we ended up just, you know, throwing stuff away and selling it and, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. And it was this amazing purging experience. I can't explain. It was, it was, it was, um, it was, it was almost biblical. Like, like it was, uh, it was such a, a weight off the shore. Every time we, like we got to a point where we were really enjoying just getting rid of stuff, right? You know, it's like, we don't need this, get rid of it. And, and so, so there's that because you, you, you actually feel lighter when, when you have less of these, these, you know, kind of things weighing you down, right? Even though there are objects and stuff, stuff you've paid money for, right? You know, that, yeah. you know, and yeah. in aftermath, you know, you probably could have done better investing it, right? You know, so, so I can, I can, you know, from, I, I can speak from experience, right? That, that, you know, and we're, and we're now, you know, to a point where we're like, Hey, we got to keep this going, you know? So, so every, every home that we move every two years we move, we're downsizing the home to, you know, smaller and smaller and smaller. <laughs> and our, our goal is to, is to be able to live in a one bedroom, um, you know, apartment and that's it, you know? And, uh, and then, and that's all, you know, all we're going to need. Right. You know, and it's quite it's quite interesting how, um, you know, I, I don't know if it's an age thing or if it's but you come to this realization like, you know, none of that stuff matters, you know, and uh, it really is the people you have experiences with and what you experience. You're traveling. Right. You know, that yeah. that for us yeah. is really and, and like you as well. Right. You know, so because I, I remember we were. Um, we were on a, uh, uh, we were writing an article together. I, I can't remember, it was about six months ago or something like that. And where were you? You were like somewhere in South America uh, on a beach somewhere. And, um, and, the, and the people that, um, that you talk about, right, that you meet, I mean, it's yeah. such an, so tell, tell me about some of those, some of those, you know, people that you've met along the way that have, been, have, have really added a lot of, you know, kind of wealth to your life. I think the, I mean, it had, you're right. It's added a lot of insight because for me, I also used to think that there was, there was a certain amount that people needed to, 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 to be happy, to live well. And then I would meet these people who had far less than I could have imagined. And they're, they're happy. They consume so much less. So they make a, a smaller impact on the environment. They feel better about that. And they invest their time on their relationships the connections that they make with their, their fellow human beings. And they have more than enough because they don't spend a lot on material things. The money that they do spend are on, as you suggested, on actual experiences. So I would meet families raising their children in these RVs. They might be French or German or American. They're traveling around Central America. And it was just so cool sitting down and talking to them because you just felt like in so many cases they just oozed wisdom. They, they understood that every single one of us is terminally ill and none of us know when we're going to have a draw our last breath. Mm -hmm. And so their perspective was live for today with an eye on tomorrow, but recognize that things don't augment our levels of happiness, but experiences and relationships do. And it was so interesting, Marcel, given that I would get requests to give talks so I would fly off to different places mm -hmm. and I should probably add that after 2017 my wife said look 
you're spending so much time doing this. She is organizing the talks. I could no longer do them for free. It didn't make uh -huh. any sense. So of course. just so I don't get a slew of emails going, Andrew, great. I'm down in Chile. Why don't you fly down and give a couple yeah. of talks for free? <laughs> anyway, we you. would we would we would be enjoying these people and these perspectives. And then I would fly off to Dubai and I might be giving a talk at a, a big corporation like Facebook. And the contrast was phenomenal because although I would see people who were happy with their jobs, working really hard, I would also see people pursuing things that weren't augmenting their levels of contentment and overall they were not as happy as these people who seemingly had less, mm -hmm. but the reality was they had so much more because they had greater connections with other people. Their relationships were founded. They were they were solid. There's a, a friend of mine is an interior designer in Dubai. And I was chatting with her a couple of days ago. And I said to her, hey, um, I'll call her Janice. I said, Janice, tell me about your, your clients. Like, who are your smallest clients? And she mm -hmm. said, well, we usually we don't like clients. We don't really want to be working with people who have less than $200 million. Mm -hmm. Um, to me, that's just mind blowing. And I said, well, tell me about the people that you work with. Tell me about mm -hmm. the people that you work for, that you're, mm -hmm. you're redesigning the insides of 737s. Like we're not talking Lear jets here, Marcel. No. We're not talking like the inside <laughs> of a Lear jet. I know. She showed me, these, she showed me these photos of these airplanes and I'm private planes. I'm like, what uh, is that thing? Is that, is that the inside of a boat? Is that someone's <laughs> house? Is that, that, that's the 737. Yeah. And I asked her, like, tell me about these people. Are they happy? And she said, they're, they're fully miserable. Yeah. And so I don't believe that billionaires necessarily are miserable people. But what mm -hmm. I do believe is that people that are looking for external validation, mm -hmm. they're pursuing more and more things and high grade upgrades on upgrades on the things that they have mm -hmm. they're perpetually pursuing something that will never give them added levels of happiness or contentment mm -hmm. based on studies so i don't believe billionaires by and large tend to be miserable people mm -hmm. but i believe that anyone that is in the pursuit of more and more and looking at material things mm -hmm. generally are not happy as people that uh yeah. get their happiness from within yeah, and, and I, I agree with you. I, you know, I've, I've, um, I actually coach a number of, um, you know, financial bankers and, you know, and in, in, in the private banking industry and things like that, and the, and the high net worth people that they work with. And I've coached a number of, you know, billionaires. And, um, and, and what I, what I tend to find exactly the same is, is people who chase extrinsic validation, right? You know, who, who, you know, are need the status, they need the recognition, they, but they don't have the ability to, to, to be content with themselves as as you know as as human beings right um, they they tend to be the ones struggling the more money they make right you know as mm -hmm. where yeah. as where there are there are you know billionaires out there who have stayed true to themselves and who probably you know would be doing what they're doing today even if it didn't make them money right you know they're, right. they're very they're right. very passionate about about you know what they're what they're doing and you know the business that they've built and and all of that kind of stuff, and and for them, it, it isn't about you know ever about the money. It just that just happens to be a, a symptom, right? You know of of the yeah. of the things that you do. Yeah, and you know what's what's really funny? It reminds me, um, you know, la last year I was actually I was in a very interesting workshop, and they did a a, a um, an exercise, and it's called Have Do Be, and and so so in this exercise, what they do is they kind of they kind of ask the audience to say, you know what. What are, what are the things that you want to have in life, right? You know, what are the things that you feel you need to, uh, you know, to be able to, to have that you can do things with, right? You know, so that you can be whatever, right? You know, and so people are like, oh man, yeah, I need a Mercedes and I need a, you know, and I want a, uh, you know, a big house and I want, you know, whatever. And it's like, yeah, and the guy's just writing down a whole big list and there's this huge list of the haves, right? And he was like, okay, so, so what are you going to do with those things, right? You know, and so the list became shorter. <clears throat> right, you know, and it's like, well, it's like I'm going to drive around. I'm going to show my friends. I'm going to, you know, and and he says, and then when you do these things, what are you going to be? Right, and and there was one word, right, 
And, and uh, people just could not think beyond one word, and that was the word happy. Right? So, so he, then, he then kind of turned around and said, okay, so if you have this list, you can then do these things, right, so that you can be happy. Right? People, yeah, that kind of makes sense, right? And he says, what if we flip this around? And so he says, he says, let's turn this into a be, do, have conversation. Right? What if you can just be happy? Does being happy cost money? And people are like, no, right? So, so what's, what's stopping you from being happy today? Right? You know, people are like, oh, that actually kind of makes sense. And if you, if you are happy, you know, what, what can you do with that happiness? What are the things, you know, you can connect with your friends, you can make a difference in the world, you can, you know, kind of all of these kind of things. And, and what will you then have? Right? Oh, I'll have you know, great experiences. I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll be exactly kind of that whole thing. He says, now look at both life choices. Which, which do you think kind of makes more sense? Right? And, people, and everybody in the audience went, holy crap. You know, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a have, do, be person. Right? But I need to be a be, do, have person. Right? You know, so I can, I can be whatever I want to be. I don't need a, a, a dollar sign or anything like that to dictate my happiness, right? You know, and, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, exercise was fantastic. And, um, and I think, I honestly think everybody should do that exercise with themselves, right? You know, say, you know, what, what do you want to be? You know, and I think, I think a lot of the, um, you know, the, the, the big entrepreneurs out there, right? You know, the, the, the billionaires, they know who they are. Right, you know, and, and they and they are, you know, who they are. And they and and no matter how much stuff they will have, right, it's not going to change who they are, you know, and uh, and that and that passion, you know, is is often what makes them infectious, right? You know, what makes people then wanna kind of, you know, invest money in them, right? You know, because uh, because they'll you know, because they, they can see that, you know, this there's this undying energy there, you know, that is self fueled. You know, it's not reliant on, on um, you know, excuses and, you know, you know, what we think might be good reasons, you know, or whatever it is, it's, it's they are just driven by a passion for life, right? You know, and I, and, and, and I think so too. And I, I you know, I've, I just want to say we're, we're, we're just, you know, kind of like over the hour. So, so Andrew, that was, what a phenomenal conversation. Um, so, so wonderful to have you uh, online and, and sharing, sharing with the audience. Uh, this video is gonna, you know, once, uh, once we stop it, it's gonna be, you know, on Facebook and LinkedIn forever, right? You know, it's also gonna be on YouTube. So, you know, check out, check out uh, my, my personal YouTube channel. Andrew's gonna be on it, which is gonna be phenomenal. Um, and of course, if you wanna get hold of Andrew, uh, you know, whether it's for talks or for financial advice or, or anything like that, uh, I have uh, his website at the bottom of the screen, andrewhelm.com. Uh, and of course, you can connect with Andrew uh, anywhere. Um, you know, it was, uh, that was such a, such a wonderful conversation. Uh, do you want to, do you want to add anything, Andrew? Wow. I think, I think, I think maybe just leaving people with the notion that we have to invest in the things that matter most mm -hmm. and, and that's the relationships that we have with other people. Mm -hmm. And I think if we can, if we, to me, a successful person is a person that recognizes that and nurtures that so somebody mm -hmm. can have a lot of money but they're not successful unless they also recognize this most important component that's i think the thing i'd probably like to leave people with beautiful yeah you know and uh, and hopefully uh you know uh, people who are watching this will uh take some of those lessons and uh, and do something with it. Uh, so I also want to give you a shout out to Marcus Marsden, uh, who uh, who read your book and uh, and actually wrote me a private message. And and uh, and, and Marcus, I'm, I'm going to throw your name out out there. But uh, I and he just said it's, it's a life changing book. So so guys, um, and I, I agree with that. Uh, if you can get hold of Andrew's books, uh, anything that Andrew does, read his blogs. It's it's really inspiring, and it will keep you grounded for for a long time. So, Andrew, thank you so much for uh, for joining me today. It was such a pleasure catching up with you again. And uh, you know, and if there's anything you need from me, uh, you know, you know where I am, right? You know, so I'm gonna I'm thank, gonna log off and say you. you are most welcome. And uh, I'll uh, I'll see you uh, next time around. Right. Okay.
Wonderful. Right. Please okay. say hello to your family for me. I will do that. And same, same to Pele. You know, please say hi. Right. Okay. All right. Will See ya. Do. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Marcel. Okay. Thank bye -bye. you. Wow. That was uh, that was quite the uh, conversation. So uh, I'm actually just switching screen here. Where am I? There we go. All right. So uh, so wow. That was uh, that was mind blowing. So uh, you know, it, 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 and there are such wise people out there in the world who you know can share so much. And to me, that's what leadership is about. Leadership leadership isn't about a couple of glorified uh, you know positions and high you know CEO you know level uh, functions. Leadership is something that we exhibit every single day, and every single one of us is is a leader in some aspect of our lives and uh and it's when we when we take responsibility for that leadership and apply ourselves every day in that way with that responsibility towards ourselves towards the people we love and towards society that's when we can start making the world a better place so uh so again um you know thanks so much to to andrew uh i'm gonna log off here thank you so much viewers uh, it was it was wonderful seeing your comments, and uh, I hope that you'll be on next week. And next week, I have a special guest, and we're going to be talking about resilience. And I'll be doing some posts on that this week as well. All right, everybody. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.